The End of Procreative Self-Corruption. How? The title of our presentation reflects the title of the Cambridge element that Amanda Sukenik and I recently published, Antinatalism, Extinction and the End of Procreative Self-Corruption. In the book we say many things, some of which may be true. Here we concentrate on the end of the last chapter, the part where we have left behind the weather and the why, and focus on the when and the how. Some motivation to get you in the mood, though. The book is about the irrationality and possible immorality of reproduction, a topic that I have tormented some of you with before, starting about 20 years ago. Let me begin this time by citing some long-dead people who in their time agreed with my odd views. First off, we have Arthur Schopenhauer, who in his On the Sufferings of the World in 1851 wrote, If children were brought into the world by an act of pure reason alone, would the human race continue to exist? Would not a man rather have so much sympathy with the coming generation as to spare it the burden of existence, or at any rate not take it upon himself to impose that burden upon it in cold blood? Schopenhauer combines, like I did 20 years ago, rationality and morality. Not the best of ideas I have learned since. Somehow the combination, irrational and immoral, rubs people the wrong way. A few decades later, Marie Huot, a French poet, writer, feminist, animal rights and vegetarianism activist, partly answered Schopenhauer's question. In her 1892 public address, The Pain of Living, she noted, Happiness does not exist for anyone. Misfortune is the common law. But the stupid love of life is so strong that the vast majority submit and resign themselves to suffering. Still, if man only accepted this burden for himself, he could be forgiven. But he cowardly perpetuates the cursed heritage by giving life to beings who did not ask to be born. More often than not, he commits this homicide unconsciously, but when he premeditates the crime, no punishment is severe enough to make him atone for it. So Schopenhauer, starting from reason, asked, would not a man have enough sympathy not to create more sufferers? To which we all responded, referring to human instinct, apparently not. Philosophers are allowed to make all sorts of hypothetical assumptions, and I'll use my prerogative now. I'll assume that Schopenhauer's kind of rationality has won the day, so hold on to your hats, please. Imagine that the following has happened. People have momentarily come to the conviction that having children is irrational and immoral. Their reasons for the conviction may vary, but they are serious. They are in fact so serious that people have decided to end their reproduction, although they know that the will to have offspring is strong and that universal abstinence will lead to the extinction of the species. In this situation, accepting these premises, what should these antinatalists, potential extinctionists, do to achieve their goal? How could they end human reproduction safely, efficiently, and completely? Or are there other options that deserve to be considered? The goals people pursue by ending procreation could perhaps be achieved by other ways. Then why not resort to those instead? In the book we consider 13 alternatives, six imaginary buttons in the colors of the rainbow, four political solutions, and three other possibilities. Here they are, in list form, before we dive into the details. The big yellow button, the big orange button, the big red button, the big violet button, the big blue button, the big green button, antinatalist superwomen or supermen, antinatalist dictatorship, antinatalist cult or religion, antinatalist liberal democracy, rational persuasion, Benevolent machine. Cunning of reason. And then, without further ado, to the details. A brief description and assessment of every alternative follows. 
Please bear in mind the hypothetical starting point. People want change, the question is how. The big yellow button, technological removal of suffering. This is a solution envisioned by transhumanist philosopher and self-reported soft antinatalist David Pierce. He proposes that hard antinatalism be abandoned in favor of pursuing bioengineered bliss. Humankind could, he believes, by mechanical biotechnology eliminate suffering and thereby solve procreation's ethical issues. And this, he further believes, is more realistic than people stopping to have children. We have, in the book, expressed our doubts. Eliminating suffering by any means would, of course, be good, but we remain unconvinced that technology could come to the rescue quite so conveniently. The Big Orange Button Immortality by Biomedical Gerontology In this scenario, suggested by Aubrey de Grey, biomedical gerontology would be the solution. Humans could live for hundreds of years and the survival of humanity could be secured without reproduction, at least for the time being. It would be a technological paradise. This could be an acceptable solution to the antinatalist extinctionists of our hypothetical case. No more childbearing, and in a few centuries or millennia, people and their agony would be gone. But the question of feasibility remains. The technology for considerably extended lifespans doesn't exist, nor is there any sign that it would exist in the future. There is something very 1990s about these techno-enthusiastic dreams. The big red button, obliteration of humankind. So, you can end all suffering by pressing a button. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint. Humankind ceases to exist in the process as well. Do you press the button? This is, of course, a mere thought experiment with no reality attached to it. As such, as a thought experiment, those who are keen on removing pain and anguish may say yes. Many others, horrified, say no. As for antinatalists, some of them are passionate advocates of this idea. Others believe that it should not even be spoken about. Odds are that the matter would continue to be divisive within our imaginary situation. The Big Violet Button. Immigration to Virtual Reality. Yes, here we become... Uh to the ultimate video game. Our minds are uploaded to the digital world and we languish in an endless utopia of virtual pleasure. But is this a solution at all? Does it stop reproduction? We argue in the book quite innovatively, I'd say, that it doesn't. Mind uploading is a vague idea, but it stands to reason that the original person would not actually survive it a different body, a different mind. The originals would arguably die, and new individuals be born. But that's against the rules. Our hypothetical decision-makers wanted to prevent new individual sufferers being born. Close, but no cigar. The big blue button, irreversible collective infertility. This button creates a world very much like the one depicted in the film Children of Men. If pressed, no one can ever have children again, and humanity would now face a grueling and miserable slow extinction. The blue button is sometimes seen as a kinder alternative to the red button, as it would allow people to live out their lives. Which may be just as well, we'll see when we reach our option, Cunning of Reason. Our reaction to this in the book was an unashamed yuck. Really? Instead of a nice, clean demise, you would commit the remaining generations to meaningless misery? Not our cup of tea. The Green Button. Humankind makes room for other species. Patricia McCormack, in a vision she calls a human, advocates the departure of humankind in order to leave room for the flourishing of other species and the natural environment. People stop having offspring and die away trying to spend the rest of their time on Earth making amends for the harm the species has done. The final caring practices leave a legacy in which our memory lives on. Nice vision, and well in line with the hypothetical decision, our starting point here. But we have our doubts whether nature, left to its own devices, would be quite as harmonious as McCormack envisages. 
Antinatalist superwomen or superman. Moving on from the New Age vibes to the world of comic books, a person with superpowers comes to the rescue, devises an antinatalist plan, gets everyone to accept it, and off we go. Literally. Except, of course, that this is not going to happen, and even entertaining the idea could be dangerous, as proven possibly by an antinatalist dictatorship, which, unfortunately, is a more likely scenario. Authorities, realizing that people will not forego having children voluntarily, make it legally obligatory. And, of course, no good will come of this. Potential parents will suffer, find ways of bypassing the regulation, revolt, and what have you. Not to be recommended to the decision makers of our hypothetical case. Antinatalist cult or religion? Yes, well, as we detail in the book, various Gnostic Christian sects attempted this very idea. But these attempts usually ended in mass persecution, slaughter, and genocide. If times are different now, someone could perhaps try this. Patricia McCormack's A Humanism does already embrace the occult, so that might be a candidate, if irrational is the route we want to take. Antinatalist liberal democracy. As far as we can see, this is not in sight for the time being. In our hypothetical case, it would have to be up there among the options, of course. Only the world would have to change quite a bit. Then, again, it could already be changing. In some parts of the world, there is more freedom of opinion, reproductive autonomy, and realization of the horrors of the world than before. Maybe something is brewing. Rational persuasion. This, of course, is the only ethical way forward in a liberal democracy, and this is our commitment in the book. No force, no coercion, just talk and perhaps jingles, art is allowed, we think. Investigations continue into how effective this method is or isn't. It doesn't seem to be working fantastically well so far, but the movement is young and we are only just getting started. Look out, world. Benevolent Machine a scenario that Thomas Metzinger has presented as a threat rather than a promise. Machine intelligence, so-called, is evolving, and sooner or later a computer will be clever and kinder than we are. That computer can then decide to help us. People will never, on their own, stop their suffering, so they need assistance. The benevolent, omnipotent machine presses the red button, and we are all history. As said, this is now seen as a threat. For our clients in the hypothetical case, it would be a lucky opportunity. Be that as it may, worth considering whatever one thinks of the desirability of human extinction. Cunning of reason. The benevolent machine is a mere technological variation of a bigger theme, the cunning of reason. This is at the same time the most difficult and the easiest notion to explain. The most difficult in that it's philosophical. Jörg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, the 18th and 19th century German scholar, stated that the world is developing pretty much without human intervention. There are ideas that clash and develop, but humankind is for all intents and purposes just a spectator in this play. In the end, freedom and democracy will be victorious, and we can only admire their blossoming. Well, the dialectic of grand ideas apart, in the real world the concept is simple. Whatever we think we are doing, bigger forces are already moving us towards, in our case, the end of reproduction. People's self-interest reduces birth rates. Pollution reduces sperm counts. Education reduces women's inclination to have children, and so on. We don't have to do anything. The end is already nigh. And with this thought we leave you. Whether or not you agree with the people in our hypothetical case, these scenarios, especially the cunning of reason ones, are something to be thought about and discussed.